Welcome to the Sports Hash Podcast. I'm your host, mate, so shout out my co-host is James Evans. We've got yet another guest on. We've got Chisanga Malata. Cheers for joining us, pal. Cheers for having us, guys. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. For the viewers that aren't quite sure who you are, can you explain a bit what you do? Oh, okay. Well, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I'm a, a combat sports journalist at the Daily Star and Daily Express, and my particular area of expertise is mixed martial arts. Now, I've been at the Daily Star and Daily Express, I think, for, I think, it's seven years now in October. Time is flying. But I've been uh, specializing in MMA for them uh, for the last five years. So, yeah, that's that's what I do. <laughs> uh, obviously, you just touched upon earlier, you're predominantly MMA sort of combat sports based. Is there any sort of other sports you cover with the Express? Um, when they need when they need manpower football, because I think that's. Yeah. Yeah, it's a prerequisite. If you're going to be a sports journalist in this country, you have mm. to be able to uh, to cover football. But yeah, that that's about it. Tennis and everything else and F1, it literally just goes all over. So <laughs> I don't really have, I have a very basic knowledge of that, of those sports. <laughs> and uh, obviously going into MMA, what have you made of Fight Island? So that's just sort of came to a conclusion recently. I think it was like the, okay, so let, 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 let me preface this by saying, Dana White, when he was uh, when he was teasing that he's gotten an island, he kind of made it out like it was this exotic island in the middle mm. of the Pacific that was being purpose built for the uh, for the event. And uh, I was I was a tad disappointed when it came out to be Yaz Island when it turned out to be Yaz Island. But as far as the events itself, they they were fantastic. I mean, what was it? It was four or five cards in fifteen days or something like that. It was it, it was it was phenomenal, and I was really impressed with the. Uh, the, the COVID precautions that they were taking because as of yet, I haven't seen any major sporting league in the world take such precautions. And yeah, Dana, Dana was confident saying that he'd think that it, it, it could be a major success and that he'll be able to pull it off. And he was correct. And now many other leagues in particular boxing, they're following his, uh, his and the UFC's suit for uh, COVID precautions. So I thought it was, if I was to grade it, I'd give it, I would give it an A plus or an A minus. Only an A minus because it wasn't actually an island in the remote <laughs> of the ocean. But other than that, it was it was stellar. Which was your favorite fight on the island? Oh, favorite fight on the island. Um, I think for me, and some people may lambast me for saying this, but I think it was I think it was Whitaker versus Till for me because it was a very like much like Darren's previous fight against Kelvin Gastelum, it was a very strategic fight and both men were very cautious of, uh, of over committing. And I, I like those, uh, those matchups now to the blood and guts fans and the just bleed fans who just want an all out war. It's not their cup of tea, but for me, I think that was probably, that was probably my favorite fight. And then second was the Volkanovsky Holloway two fight. How, how I've, I've got, I was going to bring that up anyway. Um, how was you scoring that one? I scored that from Max, hundred percent. Good man, good man. Yeah, I, I hunt. Well, did you, Mason? Did you score it for Volko or? Yeah, I had it, uh, edged it three two Volko. Yeah. See, I initially, and I think this was because I'd also enjoyed some beverages as well. I'd initially tweeted, <laughs> initially tweeted robbery, but when I when I watched <laughs> when I watched re, when I rewatched the you know, the following day, I realized it was a lot closer than uh, yeah. than than I'd initially yeah <laughs> than I initially thought, but. I did think Max definitely did enough to to win the fight, and it's a shame for him because now he kind of finds himself in this position where, on paper, like it doesn't matter how close the losses are, you've lost twice to the champions. So, but I, I I don't know. Dana White seems keen on giving him a, a a third shot, but I kind of feel bad for Volkanovski because, like as, as he quite rightly said, are we just going to keep doing this until Max wins or like? So I I I think for the for the sake of the featherweight division, I think. That he should fight the uh, Volko should fight the winner of Korean Zombie against uh, who's he fighting Ortega whenever that fight finally happens. I think we see a lot of people throw the term robbery a lot across, as particularly with the MMA sort of community and the uh, sort of the judging system and whether or not it's correct and accurate. Um, obviously, I did score it to Holloway in that fight, but you know, obviously going into the third, third round and towards the later minutes of the third round, we sort of saw. Volkanovski sort of step up a bit because you know at the top of his mind he must have been thinking you know I could be three 0 down here, and um, with the last minute or so we sort of started to see him take control in a way and obviously four and five in my opinion with Volkanovski. So from the sort of judges' perspective, we may have seen 
a lot of them go, you know what, obviously the champion, he might be, he's 2-0 down, he's starting to get back into it. We'll probably just score that one to Volkanovski just purely because, uh, because, you know, he's got back into it recently and, you know, it makes it interesting spectacle going into the fourth and fifth round. But I, I don't think it was a robbery, but I still scored it for Max personally. But, you know, it's a shame. I totally agree with you. I don't... As much as we all want to see the third fight, I, I don't think it should be right away. I think Max sort of needs some time away and sort of get back to the drawing board and figure out what's next. And and there's there's definitely more contenders out there who are well and truly deserve the title shot. You look at Zabi, who's unfortunately had his fight with Ye postponed. That's uh, a, but yeah, that's, that's quite fight. <laughs> 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 it's, a, it's, it's a shame for Zabit, but no, I totally agree with you. I think the winner is Korean Zombie, and Brian Ortega faces the winner, uh, obviously faces the champion. But who do you think takes that one with Ortega and uh, the Korean Zombie? I've, I, I, I don't know. I, I, something, something. Well, we haven't seen Brian Ortega fight since that Max Holloway fight, have we? Yeah, mm, mm. uh, that, that was that nearly, but that'd be two years ago in December. Oh, December, yeah, December. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's been a long time, so. Part of me at this moment in time, obviously because of inactivity, uh, and let's not forget that that's the type of fight, the, the, the Holloway-Ortega fight, that's the type of fight that changes the fire, like the amount of punishment that uh, Ortega took in that fight. So we don't know if he's going to be the same again. Like there's there's no tangible evidence to say that, okay, he'll, he'll get back to his best or how, how he was beforehand. So at this moment in time, I'm going with uh, Chang for sure. And touching on uh, your previous point, well, uh, the question I made where by you scored Fight Islands A minus. Do you think that? Do you well? Do you believe that UFC has been smoothly run since the post sort of COVID era? Um, oh yeah, as as, as smoothly as, as as it could have been. I mean, look, nothing in in this in the entire world is is, is going smoothly as, as yeah. So like, I'll, I'll give give you an example. Like uh, one of my best friends was meant to be getting married. I think uh, in two weeks' time, but it has it has to be postponed and. Just everything, like there's 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 hitches everywhere. But I think, in terms of the uh, the testing protocol for Fight Island, I think fighters were subjected to, I think it was a minimum of three or four tests. I can't remember off the top yeah. of my head. So when they got to uh, the initial hub where their flights would take off to Fight Island, they were tested, and when they landed, and then they had another test, and then I think they had another one just before fights. But I think the UFC in general, they've they've gone above and beyond to to ensure that. There was there, there was sport for people to consume because let's not forget, um, I think officially the um, the J League in South Korea were the first sporting league back, but uh, with with all due respect to the J League in, in, in Korea, <laughs> they're not the they're not one of the major major sporting leagues. So the UFC was the first major sporting league to be back, and it takes a lot of courage, uh, especially during these uh, times of uncertainty where we don't know how this virus works and i mean there's even talk that it's 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 airborne now so it takes a lot of courage to to uh for lack of a better better term put your balls in the line and say no we're going to do our utmost uh, to ensure our product is still getting out there and and most uh, you know, first and foremost sorry ensure that our fighters have an opportunity to earn money and get paid because i mean well there are so many fighters that we know. Well, we just saw the situation. Uh, I think, yeah, last was it, not last weekend, the weekend before, where um, well, Ed Herman, his opponent, fell out, and then he was unable to fight. But they only offered him ten thousand so, um, dollars as a like a as, as a stipend just to tidy him over. And during these times of uncertainty, fighters need their full pay. So I'm I'm happy with the way the UFC have uh, have done things. I. Although I was I was an I was initial skeptic, maybe I'd bought in into bought into the COVID uh, hype or well, not not hype really or whatever. Just I was just a bit overtly concerned. I was skeptical. I was like, maybe we shouldn't be doing this too soon. But they proved me wrong, and I'm happy that they've done that. And obviously, they paid the way for other sporting organizations to come back as well. So I'll give them props where props are due. Well, I'm I'm going to touch up on a, another fight that happened on the island. Uh, what was your thoughts on Jorge Masvidal? Stepping up on six days notice and cutting over twenty pounds. Um, well, he's well and truly a BMF by by name and nature. Now, really stepping up to take the biggest fight of your career on six days notice. I mean, most fighters they going going into a title fight they'll probably have what eight to twelve weeks, probably probably twelve weeks if it's a title fight, and they'll be second guessing 
everything that they've done in preparation to the fight, make sure uh, have I have I done enough road work, have I done enough grappling, sparring, jujitsu, or, or or what have you. And for Masvidal, I know he was kind of training, and but that kind of went under the radar. But to to put those fears aside and just and to to roll the dice and to back himself to just say, right, I'm just going to take the fight on on six days' notice. Well, what 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 do I have to lose? It's 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 well and truly a, a BMF move. And I mean, as if, as it pertains to the weight cut, I mean, twenty pounds in six days is just it's it's obscene to be honest. Like, and obviously he doesn't cut that much normally because obviously if he has a proper camp, he'll diet down to a certain weight and then he'll get down to one seventy in. Uh, and fight week, but to cut that amount of weight in that in that time, uh, I'm not trying to make excuses for him. Uh, but I think obviously that coupled with the time difference, because they were fighting at silly o'clock in the morning for for them, which is normal for us, like staying up and watching fights to to silly o'clock in the morning, that probably had a detrimental effect in his performance. But I thought he uh, gave a good account of himself as well. Like I mean, Usman, although he did dominate the fight, he wasn't really like, I, I think Masvidal landed the more telling and uh, punishing shots. And the proof of that is uh, Usman has a broken nose and he's out with a broken nose at this moment in time. So I think Masvidal deserves credit where credit's due. I, um, I anticipated the fight would go the way that it went. And I anticipated those fans who are new to the sport, who probably just saw Masvidal's highlight reel knockout of Ben Askren and then saw him beat Nate Diaz. I anticipated their reaction to it and saying, oh, it's a boring fight or what have you. But uh, fair play to Jorge for, for stepping up. And I think I'd, I'd, I'd like to see a rematch with uh, both fighters having a, a, a normal camp. But I just don't see how you can sell that at this moment in time. I think he's got to go and beat somebody else now. Yeah, and particularly with Dana White, he's very vocal on uh, Gilbert Burns is the next contender and the next challenger for his moment, which probably most likely take place end of the year, early 2021. So with that being said, obviously you've got Tyron Woodley and Kobe Covington sort of in the works and Leon Edwards is there or thereabouts and he recently called out Masvidal, if you've seen on Twitter. And Would you say that's fight, that fight's next for both? That's the fight that makes sense, the most sense. But it's, well, I, I don't know. Is, is there a lot of upside for, for it in terms of... Uh, in terms of thing to think, well, something to gain for for Leon because obviously Masvidal's a big name now, especially with, with casuals. But I mean, if you were to ask a lot of my peers and e even you guys, like I think a lot of us would favor Leon in the fight anyway mm -hmm. to begin with. So I mean, it's a risk. It's a risk to take. I mean, why why risk your title shot? We've seen fighters who have risked title shots. Uh, we, we've seen them fall flat in their face. I think the one that comes to mind most for me, I think it was. Uh, UFC 222, Frankie Edgar, when he got knocked out by Ryan Ortega yeah. to fight Max, obviously, and then Max fell, fell out and then he risked the title shot. So I don't know. I think I'd like to see Leon sit out a little bit longer, but it's already been over a year since he last fought now. So he's kind of in a position where he just needs to take anything he can get. So, and don't get me wrong, there's yeah, there's a grudge match there as well, and the UFC would, mm. would be able to sell that. Uh, so yeah, I think that's a fight that makes sense for, for both men. But whether or not Masvidal, who knows his worth now, like, let's not forget that because he, he went to war with the UFC and he backed himself and he got the uh, got the new contract that he wanted. And so I, 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 I don't know, do you risk it? And it was against Leon, who's, I mean, I love I, I love Leon Edwards to death. I always campaign for him wherever, <laughs> any time there's a debate or, or, or what have you. But he's just not, He's, he's just not the biggest name and that's probably partially because he doesn't talk smack or what have you but that's just not in his nature so again if you're Masvidal it's uh, it's high risk with low reward what are your thoughts on this weekend's event uh the Alexi Olenek uh, or this week oh, we, this weekend's coming man I've, this weekend's coming up yeah see, see being on furlough I've lost all concept of the <laughs> I, really, I, I really have um so this uh 252 you're talking about yeah. correct Okay, um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing Sean O'Malley versus Cheeto Vera because I think if Sean can, well, e even if he just beats Cheeto v by decision, but he looks very impressive doing it, I think you can just strap the rocket ship to him and the, this is the UFC's next star, 100%. But something tells me th this is going to be a tough fight for him. Uh, mm. 
D- don't get me wrong. I, I thought Eddie Wineland was going to be a really tough fight. Like, I I completely forgot Eddie Wineland was still fighting. <laughs> to, to be honest, obviously Eddie Wineland's an OG. But when when I saw that fight get booked, I thought, okay, this will actually be a tough fight for Sean. And he literally that fake uppercut and overhand right that he caught him with was just a thing of beauty. But yeah, going back to the point that I said there before, if Sean wins this fight and wins in impressive fashion, then the UFC have well and truly got a bona fide star in their hands. And I think, I think that's what the UFC brass are, are crossing their fingers and, and 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 praying for. And in terms of the main event, oh, I I don't know who's who's going to win this. I it, it's literally I've been looking at all the odds and everything. It's just dead even. Nobody nobody's giving the advantage to anyone. But I think the fairy tale, <laughs> the fairy tale the person in me would like to see Daniel Cormier get that win and then and then hang it up. But it's going to be tough. And I, well, I, I don't know. Some of the comments that I've seen from Stipe, and it, it kind of seems obviously, obviously he he uh, exacted revenge emphatically against Daniel last August, but he seems to be a a bit more confident, like almost a bit too confident, if if you know what I mean. And let's not forget, until he made that adjustment in the fourth round when he started going for the body shots, like faking the right hand and slipping and going for the body shots, he was he was losing the fight. Mm-hmm. So, but. Okay, I'll go for an official prediction. I'll go for Daniel to win. Well, while you spoke about Sean before, uh, what's next for Sugar Sean if he does win? Ooh, what's next for him? Well, in this crazy age of matchmaking, you can't tell, right? Like, I mean, nobody expected Cody Garbrandt to get the shot against uh, Davidson Figueredo, but I wouldn't be surprised that if he beats Chio, I wouldn't be surprised if they give him someone in the top five. I, I I really wouldn't. Let's like I'm trying to think stylistically who would who would be a good matchup for him. Um, uh, I don't know. I was about to say Corey Sanhagen, but he's already booked, isn't he? Mm. Um, okay, maybe let me let me revise that. Maybe not. Maybe not top five. Maybe maybe someone in the top eight or whatever. Because again, I think the UFC they're they're going to care be careful with the matchups. quite go down the boxing route of you know, you know they'll they'll give a fight this is improvements that he's made during training camp or what have you but right i, I wouldn't be surprised if we see sean fight for a title You guys still there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're still there, mate. Okay, we you back. Can you hear us? I can hear. I can hear you both now. Yeah. Yeah. About that. I don't know what went on there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. A bit of a technical difficulty, shall we say? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. As as we were saying before it all cut out. Um, who 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 do you think that the UFC will offer offer to Sean O'Malley if he is victorious come Saturday? Uh, I was probably as I, as I was saying beforehand. I I initially said somebody in the top five, but I think that might be a, a bit too soon. I'd probably say somebody in the in the top eight. They'll want to give him somebody that will um, kind of kind of like when the UFC matched up Conor McGregor against Dustin Poirier. They'll want to give him someone who is going to be a stern test, but. A test that he can pass, and one that he can possibly that he can pass and flying cut with flying colors. So I definitely say someone in the top eight. I off the top of my head, uh, I don't know. I mean, as as I said, I I would have loved to have seen the Cody Garbrandt fight, but obviously Cody's now fighting for the title at one twenty five. But yeah, I would definitely say somebody in the in the, in the top eight, and then I can see Sean fight. Oh, I I can see Sean fighting for a title in early twenty twenty one for sure. Well, while you touched up on um, Cody getting the title shot at 125, do you think that was the right move for Cody? Um, well, <laughs> it's, uh, when when you look back at the the amount of well muscle that TJ Dillashaw had to lose to make 125, I mean, I don't know if you guys remember the pictures of him uh, from the weigh-in that day, the the official way, uh, the official weigh-in in the morning. He looked like a skeleton and. It had a detrimental effect on on his uh, on on his performance. Well, so much so, obviously, he had to use EPO just to 
well, as he said, stay healthy and just to be able to train. But the lack of uh, the lack of brain fluid around the fluid around your brain can it, it can have a detrimental effect on your ability to take a shot. So, like, I, don't get me wrong, the the matchups it, stylistically, it's a it, it's going to be a firefight, a hundred percent, and it's definitely a fight. You can quote me on this that I could say that fight is not going to go the distance. I don't know how no. it'll go the distance, it, but. In terms of meritocracy, uh, look, I, as I said, I've, I always campaign for Leon Edwards because obviously he's on an eight-fight win streak. And I'd like to see the UFC go back to their... Um, I'd like to see the matchmaking team go back to their merit, meritocratic ways where fighters get the title shots based, based off merit, not just based off uh, big names. But I'm not surprised the UFC gave Cody the, the fight against Davison because... Well, since Demetrius Johnson left, uh, oh, well, well, with the exception of Henry Cejudo, and he's only been in and out of the division, um, the flyer division doesn't have a big name. They need they need big names. They need to try and and uh, sell the division. And the former former champion Cody Garbrandt, who's who who has kind of crossed over into the mainstream as well. People people know who he is. I mean, like he's a uh, like he, he's a handsome guy. He's he's like girls who casual girls who just observe fights very very casually. <laughs> they know who he is and what have you. And that's the type of person that you need to have in ideally in each division to, to draw attention to them. So I can understand the UFC's uh, thought process in giving in giving uh, Cody the the fight. Do I think one victory after snapping a three fight uh, losing streak merits a title shot? No, but I mean crazy times and let's not forget as well we are in the midst of a pandemic the ufc need to try sell as many pay-per-views as many espn plus subscriptions as they can at this moment in time so that's going to influence their matchmaking policies for well i'd probably say for at least the next year 100 percent obviously just touching on your um journalistic standpoint your journalistic career obviously both the express and the daily star both tabloids have you sort of had to change your writing style based on the consumers that read both outlets uh, yes, I'd say so. So, um, with the w- when when it comes to writing for the Daily Star in particular, when I'm writing in print, I have to be a lot more. It has to be a lot more short and concise and snappy, basically. Mm. But where when it when it comes to writing for the Daily Express in particular online, I have a lot more freedom to to um, utilize the, the vocabulary and technical jargon that I that I want to whatsoever. But I, I have no issue floating between between the two actually, and I, sometimes I do like just writing short and snappy stories if you, if, you, if you know what I mean. And sometimes the the readership appreciates that, but then when it comes to to long form stuff, I do like taking my time and like having having long interviews. So, for instance, uh, I, I just did an interview with Javier Mendez. Yeah, was it yes? No, it was a couple of days ago or what have you. This is prior to me knowing that my furlough was going to be extended. So I thought, right, I'm going to have stuff for, to write for Fight Week or what have you. So for the stuff on the star, I would have taken snippets of the of the interview and then done separate stories uh, for the respective uh, lines that came out for them. But if I'm writing it on the Express, I do a long form piece. I try to write maybe like a thousand words or, or what have you, because that's that's what I prefer to do, actually, writing long form pieces. But in... Uh, in this day and age of journalism as well, you, you have to be able to adapt. You have to be able to do both. How did you get started <clears throat> doing what you do? Oh, how did I get started? Okay, so I, uh, I went to University in Edinburgh and studied, uh, studied journalism. Shock. <laughs> but, <laughs> no, initially... Or just go and do journalism in general, and then if you like it, then you... I came, I came back to the, uh, I came back to oh, are you, uh, sorry, it, my computer froze there. Yeah, okay, so where were you asking me where, how I got started? Yeah. Okay, so um, as I said, I went to Edinburgh to study journalism uh, and then I moved back down to London in... When did I move down? I think it was, it was in, it was the summer of 2013, and then I uh, did a work placement at the, the Daily Telegraph for a couple of weeks, 
And then it took a few months for me, a few months of me reaching out to as many people as I could, uh, just trying to pester them saying, oh yeah, is there any entry level jobs or is there any weekend shifts or, or what have you, uh, just to try to get my foot in the door. And then actually it's, it's a funny story. So then I, I was actually working at a ZZ's restaurant uh, whilst I was doing, uh, trying to do work placements. And my dad, he went to a house party and the last person he spoke to before he left happened to be the uh, deputy editor of the Daily Star. And uh, my dad, being the cheeky guy that he is, he asked, uh, he said, oh, can my, can my son just have a day's work, uh, work experience? And uh, so then my dad comes back from the party. I come back from a long shift at the restaurant, where have you. And then this must have been about like 11 o'clock. And then my dad said, okay, you need to get up at six o'clock because you're going to London to do a shift at eight o'clock or what have you. And I was literally, I kid you, I was like this close to saying to my dad, no, I'm just having my line or what, what have you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, literally, I was, I was that close just to saying, yeah, I, I don't want to go. I've had a long day. I just want to relax. This was my day off as well, my one day off of the week. And then uh, I, I sucked it up. I went, I did the, the day's work experience, uh, not work experience. Uh, it, was, it was kind of like a work experience slash trial thing. I didn't hear back for a couple of weeks and then I just sent another email, uh, thank you email saying, thanks very much for the time. I really appreciate it. And uh, if there's any any positions that are available, please uh, please let me know. I got an email back maybe an hour later saying there's some trials for over, or, overnight reporters. And then I just took it and took the opportunity. And then that was it. Then as I say, the rest is history to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but as I said at the, at the start of uh, the show, I'd, I'd predominantly started uh, covering football and 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 with the, when I was uh, at the Star when I got onto the uh, the daytime sports team and then I'd say, yeah then how many years now I'd say about five years ago is when I started specialising in combat sports and in particular MMA. Would you say that would be your sort of advice to those? Obviously, you've got to be willing to be flexible around these outlets and you know whenever the, you get the call, you should be button their hand off and you should be ready to go straight away a hundred percent that's that that would be my number one piece of advice to any aspiring journalist or to anybody aspiring in, in any field that when you get the call you just have to no matter of what reservations or fears that you might have or concerns or even even self-doubts because I, I had a lot of self-doubts going, going into it as well in particular because i there was like a period of months where i didn't hear back from anybody um no matter the self-doubts and reservations that you have, you just, once the opportunity comes, you just have to grasp it. And also, you've got a real, someone's, I don't know who's at the door there, but <laughs> uh, just give me two seconds afterwards. I'll, 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 let me finish this off because it was quite a rousing speech there as well. That person's kind of, kind of messed <laughs> it up. Um, yeah, as I was saying, no matter the fears, reservations you have and uh, concerns over, social life and family life or, or what have you when you get the call just jump at the opportunity because again if this is your dream you should be willing to sacrifice some uh, some personal pleasures or what have you to to fulfill it and although it might seem tough uh, uh, for a while so, so to give you some context i worked overnight uh, whilst i had a, a long-term girlfriend and this was a long distance relationship as well i did that for seven months straight and I've had some colleagues who have been on nights for two years before they actually got their break. So you have to be willing to uh, to embrace the suck, embrace the hurt as well, but it will all work out in the end. And obviously I did a thread on Twitter about a month or two ago and you responded to it. And particularly in England and across the UFC as a nation, they're not highly represented but um the ones that are signed on are just such a plethora of talent and um, do you think that the nation from your standpoint is particularly overlooked upon um i'd say so yeah 100 percent. and i'd i'd say that yeah a, a lot of a lot of my colleagues from from the uh from across the pond they 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 they, they, they still to this day a lot of them still believe the old mantra that are oh, the brits can't wrestle they can't grapple or what have you but I mean, now you just got, got to look at guys like Arnold Allen, who's a, mm. a, class, a class grapper, and he is, his success in the UFC, I, I don't know how many he's won in a row now in the UFC. I think he's on a six or seven, six, six, five win streak or seven. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But that just lays weights to that, that old notion. But 
I definitely agree that, that we are overlooked because we are still a small island. Let's let's not forget that as <laughs> as well. And in terms of uh, mixed martial arts, the I'd still say the hotbeds are obviously the United States and Brazil, and now now Russia, in particular Dagestan as well. So I say we're we're being overlooked, but to a certain extent, not as bad as it was maybe five or ten years ago or what have you. But with obviously Michael Bisping winning UFC gold and uh, the UFC 199. I remember literally at 5:30 in the morning. I was I was meant to file on the well, of on the on the buzzer fight report or whatever. But like I just jumped up on my bed and I was like bouncing around the room, <laughs> or what have you. But obviously Bisping uh, Bisping uh, winning the title that showed the entire world that the Brits are a force to be reckoned with, and that you can't overlook them. In particular, Bisping doing it because he'd gotten so close to the mountain. He's so close to the top of the mountain, and then he'd lose a number one contenders match. So for him to get over the hump, I think that well and truly showed that we are a force to be reckoned with. And I think, I think that eventually, when Darren Till does win a title, because I don't think it's a question of if he win, if he'll win one, it's a question of when he'll win a title. That will uh, that will further lay waste to the to the to the to the old sayings that the the Brits can uh, can only strike and they can't do everything else and then then I think we'll get our just dues. Well, out of all the people you've spoke to by doing what you do, who's been the favourite person you've spoken to? Oh, favourite person I've spoken to? Okay. Um, oh, wow. That's... <laughs> okay. Um, I'll tell you... Okay, let me start off. The, the least favourite was Floyd Mayweather because he's the most arrogant man <laughs> child I've ever, I've ever met. Uh, most favourite interview? Um, oh, that's a... I probably, Michael Bisping, definitely. Definitely, yeah. I've I've had the pleasure of interviewing Mike like face to face, like sit down half an hour interviews. I think maybe four four times, four or five times, and each it, it each time the time just goes by like that. And then I've invariably deviated from my question, uh, my route of questioning or what have you. So that just we we all know what Mike's personality is like. He's an infectious, lovable character. Um, he has changed over the years because obviously um, many a moon ago. A lot of people didn't like him, <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I'd say Michael Bisping is definitely my favorite interview, no doubt. And then I'd say maybe Darren Till is a close second, and then a third. Nah, I'll just leave it with those two. Yeah, those. Yeah, I can't. I can't think of a third. <laughs> this is sort of a uh, follow-up question to my obviously England standpoint, but this is sort of touching across Europe. Obviously, you've seen a couple of uh, fighters from Europe burst onto the, the UFC slash MMA scene recently. You look at Rui Prochaska against uh, Volkan Ozdemir and uh, obviously most recently, uh, Kamzat Chemaev. Does the UFC sort of need to recruit more European fighters and do you think they can compete with the star fighters from America? I think, yeah, they, de- they definitely need to invest more into the um, into the hotbed of talent that we have, uh, have across Europe. And I think... They, well, they're slowly but starting to do that uh, just mm. in Dagestan alone. I, I, I mean, look at they've signed uh, Umar Nurmagomedov, Abu Bakar. Um, obviously, when they signed Zabit as well, who else? And Kamza, I know he's not from Dagestan; he's from Chechnya. But there's uh, there's a plethora of talent in these in in so many countries across uh, across Europe. In, in particular, Georgia as well. I don't know if you guys uh, know. Mm. Gigi Kikadze, he's, I don't know if you watched his last fight, but he's phenomenal. And there's like a production line of fighters like him. So the UFC, I think, I think they're still, they're still focused on developing. Well, right now, I think their focus is uh, the Middle East, in particular, obviously, with the partnership that they have with the Abu Dhabi Tourist Board. And uh, I think, I think I know that they're planning on going uh, to Dubai at some point, but I don't know when they're going to do that. But their focus is there. But I think they do need to continue scouring, scouring these markets and set up performance institutes. Like, I, I don't know if the one in Shanghai is, is done yet, but I know they're building one in, uh, in Mexico as well. So if you, build, if you build these things, the talent will come and then you'll be able to reap the rewards eventually. Uh, when you when you said the word Dagestan, obviously the one name that comes to mind is Khabib the Magomedov, and unfortunately the passing of his father meant that we couldn't see him in September. But I'm surprised he took the fight uh, a month later against Justin Gaethje in October. If he does beat Justin Gaethje, I know 
he said very vocally he wants to fight GSP in April. But what do you see is next for Khabib after Gaethje? Does he retire? Does he fight GSP? What happens? I think I, I think he fights George. I think I think he fights George. A lot of people are like, oh, the UFC will they'll they'll do their utmost to offer the Connor fight, which I think they will. But Khabib is a man of principle, and he's given some of the comments that you know, the Connor has said over the last over the last two years. It, it seems like sometimes it's it's never ending. I don't think he's going he's gonna to give him the, the rematch. And personally, for me, I think it would be the ultimate, um, it'd be the ultimate screw you to Connor, that not giving him the opportunity to to have the rematch. And as 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 I said, uh, let's not forget Habib's uh, principal man, but he's also a man who wants to cement his legacy as arguably the greatest fighter of all time. And who else who else is better to do that against than George Saint Pierre, man? Like and. I know people will say that. I, well, I think George is thirty-eight, or is yeah. thirty-eight or thirty-nine now. Okay, so he could potentially be forty next year. But by the time he <laughs> fights, by the time he fights to be. But I mean, we all saw George when he came back and forth against Michael Bisming. Like, and this this was like a prime Michael Bisming. I know in age time, like in age terms, he wasn't at his prime, but he reached his prime. There, he reached his stride. And he came back and he, well, it was, it was a flaw. Well, uh, okay. No, Bisping kind of hurt him from the, from the bottom. He cut him with the elbows or whatever. I was about to say it's a flawless performance, but it was a dominant performance, a dominant finish. Um, but I don't know if he could take another what, three year layout and then just come back and beat Habib. Mm. It's, it's a, it's a tall order, but I think Habib fights GSP, but uh, you, 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 you won't get a prediction from me cause on, on that. Cause <laughs> no. I, <laughs> I, I love both guys. And actually, going back to the interview um, question, I'll actually have to go back and change that. Darren Till's getting bumped down to number three. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, uh, George St. Pierre, because I actually met George St. Pierre just by chance, just as I was leaving my hotel in New York. I was in New York to cover the UFC 208. I believe that was home versus Durand me. Uh, initially, that was meant to be UFC 209. And... Mm. There was talk that they, they were going to have both Diaz brothers signed up for it. So that's why I thought, okay, right, I need to do everything I can to get over there and what have you. Obviously, it didn't transpire <laughs> that way. It ended up being Holly Holm and Jermaine Durand me. But um, going back to the point about George there. So when I left my uh, my hotel to go get the subway, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd spotted this guy that I thought I recognized from a distance. And then uh, there was some woman next to me, random woman. I asked, uh, "Is that is that George Saint Pierre?" And she looked at me like she didn't have a clue. She looked, <laughs> as if I may as well have been speaking another language. And I got closer to him, and it actually was him. And he was actually hailing a taxi to go to um, Renzo Gracie's. Uh, and I, I, I just said, "George, George, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Sangamara from the Daily Star and Daily Express. Do you mind if I just have like five minutes of your time? Because this is before he'd re-signed with the UFC." And uh, he gave me he gave me like a ten minute interview right there and then and what have you and uh, yeah so I put George up there but going back to that as well and this is a point that I will uh, I'll emphasize again is never 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 sleep on news because because I think I was in this euphoric state of meeting one of my favorite fighters of all time and and what have you I didn't put two and two together that George was back in New York and the same weekend the UFC were in New York holding an event. So he'd obviously had some sort of talks with the UFC and I'd asked him about his future and he's like, oh, well, uh, something might come out soon or, or what have you. And I just thought to myself, oh, because I'm the only one who's, who's, who's met him, I can, I can rest on these quotes. I can, I can use them some point next week when I get back. And then when I get back, then uh, I, I think it was Ariel Hawani then said, oh, George is in talks with the UFC coming back. And I just thought to myself, mother, mother effort, I would <laughs> swear there for a sec. <laughs> That's one lesson I'll, I'll give to you guys as well. Never sleep on news. If you get something or whatever, and once you corroborated it with uh, three in, well, three independent sources, just go for it. You've got, you've got to do it. Do you think a win over GSP will cement his uh, Khabib's legacy as the number one pound for pound great over, obviously, Lux Anderson Silva, John Jones, etc.? cetera? Um, look, I, I, I love Anderson Silva and I love John Jones. I, I love Anderson Silva more because prime Anderson Silva, the things that he would do. I don't know if you guys watched, uh, I think it was UFC, was it UFC 101 when he fought Forrest Griffin, when he moved up to light heavyweight? Have you seen that mm. fight? Yeah. That was literally like the Matrix. And to this day, my older brother, he, uh, he, <laughs> he's adamant that Forrest Griffin threw the fight. He's <laughs> because <laughs> he's adamant that Forrest threw the fight. But, um, 
going back to that, I think because of uh, the asterisk is next to Anderson and John's names, I think you do have to put George as the greatest of all time. And because George has shown, well, shown in his last fight that he's better than ever, like, well, he looked better than ever against Michael Bisping. He, he, he really did. And, and he wasn't afraid to, afraid to strike because in some mm. of his fights, he'd taken a bit of punishment and he was just eager to get the fight to the floor. Um, but he, he wasn't like that against Bismarck. So if he was to come back and put on a dominant display against George, now it depends on how George looks in the fight. If George, if, if George has lots of good exchange, it gets a better of lots of good exchanges and he, he looks good and Habib still ends up winning, then you could say, yeah, he's, he's number one. But if not, there's always going to be that debate, that barbershop debate. People will be like, oh, well, George came back. He was 40. Khabib was in his prime, if you know what mm. I mean. So... But for me, I think if he did, I, it's it's undeniable. It would be the the pound for pound goal for me. What would you say is the in the past decade in particular across the UFC? What would you say is the biggest sort of pinch me moment as a fan? Oh, pinch me moment as a fan. Uh, I think I think you guys know the answer to this one. I think is I might be being biased because <laughs> for British is Bisping knocking out Luke Rockhold a hundred. Yeah. I mean. All the odds, all the odds were stacked against him. He took the fight on what, like twelve days notice, or yeah, what have you, against a guy who had beaten him decisively as as well beforehand. And let's not forget Rockhold. I mean, in his previous fight, yeah, obviously he dethroned right Weidman because obviously Weidman was initially meant to get the rematch, but he put a beating on Chris Weidman that Chris Weidman has not mm. recovered from. Chris Weidman is not the same fighter that went into that uh, Luke Rockhold fight. So I think that was probably one of the, that was one of the biggest pinch me moments of of the decade. Obviously, Conor knocking out Jose Aldo, and I remember saying to all my friends uh, because a lot of my friends got into mixed martial arts because of Conor, and they weren't mm-hmm. aware who Jose Aldo was going into that fight. And I said throughout the build up, I was just like, he's going to make him pay for this. He's going to make him pay for all this trash talk and everything. <laughs> he's make him pay for it, and then uh, thirteen seconds later. I had egg <laughs> in my face. So I, those those for me are, are the top two. I don't know. What are yours, yours respectively, guys? Go on, Mason. You first, man. <laughs> I'd, I'd agree. I'd, I'd go the best spin title victory for me, personally. Mm-hmm. I don't, in recent times, I don't think, as a Brit, comes close. Anything comes close to best spin winning the title. What about you, James? Yeah, obviously... Predominantly as an Englishman, as a proud Englishman, to say the least, we obviously are. We obviously are going to say um, this being against Luke Rockhold, just because when he caught him with the left hand, and we were just there, like we were just stunned because it dropped him. And then going into the fight, we all talk, um, you look at Jason Perillo talking about the left hook, Larry, it's going to come yeah. up clutch that week, and you know we were just stunned. But I think from as well a good shell obviously you've got McGregor out there but I'd say McGregor Alvarez like is a is another personal one of mine because I think that was one of the I was what well, how old was that at the time I was about like 16 17 in college and it was one of the um one of the first few pay-per-view fights I've stayed up for and obviously we know McGregor the name behind the sport and the, the amount of stuff he's achieved same with Alvarez he's an absolute legend of the game and he's done a lot across various promotions Alvarez and to put in that performance against Alvarez, it was no walkover. It, was just, it just gave me goosebumps from yeah, start to finish. It was a flawless performance. When you go back and you watch it, you can't help but think what could have been if he'd kept fighting regularly. You can't mm. help but wonder what, what, what would have been. And don't get me wrong, I don't begrudge him for going for the Floyd Mayweather fight. I mean, if it's there, any combat sport athlete is going to go for it and secure, secure your, your family's future for what, the next two or three generations for sure. But, I mean, if he'd kept fighting at the pace that he was fighting at as well, because he was fighting two or three times a year yeah. like, uh, during during his pump. So you can't help but wonder what would have been. Uh, I mean, I know he said that he wanted to get back to the season this year or, uh, or performing season this year. But obviously, COVID is well and truly <laughs> uh, scrapped those plans. But um Obviously, I'm not buying the the notion that he's retired. Look, he, this no, is no, third, no. this is the third time he's done it. Um, and actually, him saying it th- that way, if if he had just said that, look, I'm not gonna, I'm, g- I'm gonna sit out until the UFC come to me or what have you, that would have held more weight than him saying I re- I retire. 
But there's no doubt in my mind that he'll fight again this year. Dana White is saying that he's not going to fight this year. So we all know it means at some point he's going to fight again this year. So. <laughs> Who do you think he faces? Is it Diaz or uh, it's a tough one? It's, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. Um, again, as I said beforehand, you, fact, you have to factor in the fact that you have to factor in COVID and loss of revenues and, and for the UFC and what have you. Um, but I think I, I think it's going to be Nate Diaz. It's, it's going to be Nate Diaz or Justin Gaethje. Well, or, or, or the winner of uh, Gaethje and Khabib. That's what I yeah. mean. So I mean, but uh, it's the the Masvidal one. It's it's a bit of a difficult sell now because he, he lost to um, he lost to Usman. But then again, Cowboy was on a two fight losing streak when he lost to yeah. uh, when he fought Connor. So I mean, you don't necessarily have to put a red hot informed fighter against Connor to to sell. So. I mean, if they were to put Connor in, if they were to put him in, in next weekend, the you do two million pay per view buys, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. But um, yeah, I, I probably, I probably think now is the best time to run back the Nate Diaz fight. It makes total sense. Yeah. When you look at these sort of fighters, and obviously in particularly with McGregor, do you feel that the so-called star fighters attract the big pay per view numbers? Uh, yeah, oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Like, um. I'm trying to think when Connor was away. So obviously he was away from the Eddie Alvarez fight, and then he came mm. back. That was November 2016, and then he came back in October 2018. Mm. I there was I think there only might have only been one pay per view that did close to a million, and off the top of my head, that was that was Bisping Saint Pierre, yeah. and that was that was that was only big because GSP obviously he he's a mainstream star as well crossover star. I, I mean he was he was in Captain America for God's sake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, his return garnered uh, a huge amount of uh, a huge amount of pay per view buys. And if you look at the figures from from when McGregor was away and uh, the the pay per views between when he was away and when he returned, the figures make for dire viewing for the UFC and. I think the the Mayweather McGregor thing was a blessing in disguise for them because obviously they took a large uh, portion of uh, portion of the revenue for that, and then obviously for Zufa at the, of, of, at the time or WMEIMG, I should say it do, it doesn't matter uh, it doesn't matter where the revenue came from whether it came from the UFC or whether it came from boxing it still came from them so I think that was a saving grace for them but the, to this day like the pay per view like the big stars they draw the pay per view numbers like I know. Uh, I know John Jones is well. Well, he is kind of a star, but only for his transgressions outside of <laughs> outside of the octagon, if, if, if you know what I mean. Mm. But uh, every time he fights, he draws like a minimum of five hundred thousand pay per view buys. Um, and I'm trying to think who else could you say? Well, Masvidal, of course, Masvidal. Mm. Um, well, I think that was also in conjunction to, to uh, the whole intrigue behind Fight Island. But I mean, it would have been interesting to see if. If what the numbers would have been if it was Gilbert Burns, because I don't think it would have been. I think it maybe would have been five hundred thousand pay per view buys, but and not the figure that was uh, that was quoted uh, for for the actual Masvidal fight. So Masvidal is undoubtedly a pay per view star, and I'd I'd say of the active stars in the UFC, he's probably he's probably the biggest. Mm. He, he probably is the biggest. Yeah. Well, in in your opinion, do you think the UFC can ever surpass the view, viewing numbers of the top boxing events? Um, oh, it's difficult to say. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, they will be very hard pressed to to surpass when Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua fight because that number. I think that will do. That'll probably do five or six million pay per views. Easy, easy. Tyson Fury, Anthony Joshua. I think maybe in maybe in a few years' time, maybe a few years' time, but maybe maybe in like a decade or so, they they might get they might get close to. To doing uh doing such numbers, I mean, Khabib McGregor did 2.2 million pay per view buys, and I was expecting it to do a lot, but I did not expect it to do close to that. And one thing that you have to they have to factor in as well for for just as for everybody that bought the pay per view, there's at least five people that streamed it, so mm. the reach is is a lot bigger than than you actually think. But I I don't know. I think it will take a, a take a bit longer It'll take oh, i don't know maybe 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 in about 15 years time 10 to 15 years time you'll start seeing pay-per-views level with uh with boxing events but the boxing events that uh, i raised before like the uh, fury and joshua whenever, whenever that happens uh, and i assume your question was centered around the big uh, boxing pay-per-views because 
some of the boxing pay per views they do very poorly. Like I remember, um, I remember when uh, when Andre Ward for uh, Sergey Kovalev for the second time that did less than a hundred thousand pay per view buys, and that's a massive fight. So. In some aspects, the UFC have already caught up with boxing, 100%. I think there was a period, I'd probably say between 20, 2014 to late 2016, obviously when Conor fought last, where they'd well and truly surpassed surpassed uh, boxing. But I think boxing has, has well and truly come back. Uh, they, they came back twice, obviously, with G, the two uh, Canelo GGG fights. But... I think, and I hope that one day mixed martial arts, in particular UFC, will be able to surpass boxing. I, I, I really do, because if that happens, then hopefully, and I mean, it should happen, that the money will trickle down and fighters will start getting their just dues. Because some some of the, the, the pay grades that you get for fighters, like in particular fighters who, make, who are making their debut, yeah, they're not in a position where they can uh, where they can haggle and say, oh, I deserve X amount for my debut. But some of them are only getting 12 and 12. And now one fighter who I interview, who I'll, I'll uh, keep, I'll, whose name I'll, I'll, I'll omit from this, he said after taxes and paying his coaches and paying his nutritionists and everything, uh, this was after his debut, he was left with 900 pounds in his bank for himself. 900 pounds. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's, it's far from ideal. <laughs> well, she, uh, that was the last of my questions. I know James uh, has some more as well, so I'll let James ask the next mm-hmm. one. Yeah, no, I appreciate the time, Stan. Thank no, you worries, so much for coming on. But um, Mason kind of touched upon one of my uh, questions earlier. Um, I'm uh, going into my third year at University of Portsmouth. And obviously, as a uni- former uni student yourself, you know you have to do sort of a dissertation, sort of yeah. an investigation. Oh, that, um, that gives me just the, the shivers just here and there. <laughs> oh, d- d- don't tell me that about now, mate. I'm, I'm in the middle of starting it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, my sort of investigation is on the UFC as a whole. and um how much would you say as an organization because early on in the days you know it was always from a sort of british standpoint and european standpoint it was always about boxing 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 you had the likes of the obviously the holyfields tysons all those big names competing so how much has the ufc as an organization changed since 1993 across great britain and europe do you feel it's sort of lived up to the expectation has it surpassed any expectation at all I think it's well and truly surpassed the expectation. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. It's so I, I started watching mixed martial arts in two thousand and two thousand and five. I think yeah, it must it must have been two thousand and five. And I only came across it because I was, I was in uh, what was the name of that, those video stores? Uh, I was in a blockbuster. Believe it or not, like yeah, but yeah, those are now a, a, thing, a thing of the past. And I, I, I came across <laughs> it and. And then, uh, yeah, then I uh, then I became an avid fan from there. And the uh, the growth of mixed martial well, the UFC the brand and mixed martial arts as a sport in general since since 2005 to now has just been exponential. No, it the UF every, every time Dana White tries to um, to big up the growth of the UFC and uh, he he always he always mentions that this is the fastest growing sport in the world. And to this day, I I agree with that notion it well and truly is the fastest growing sport in the world so much so that, in particular and in ufc is the fastest growing sporting brand in the world so much so because people who <laughs> who like who claim to be an mma fighter well they'll say oh yeah i train ufc guy dude i, I train <laughs> i train you but yeah i'd say since its inception and back then it was the wild wild west the <laughs> it, it, it well and truly was the ufc has grown to be one of the powerhouses of sport so much so that well they are the leader in the sport and i don't think they're going to be they're going to be challenged for at least another 20 years one championship are trying to make movements and, and what have you although i'm skeptical of some of their figures that they come out with and and uh, and what have you but the ufc aren't going to have a competitor for uh, for a long time unless you get a billionaire investing into a company you're they're not going to be they're not going to be touched for a while and yeah, obviously, just sort of a follow up one. Um, traditionally, back in the day, they were seen as like an American outlet. Obviously, the likes of Brazil, uh, Mexico, USA, they'd all obviously have fighters fight competing in the UFC. We never really saw any European fighters, and we barely saw any European fans because the mm-hmm. UFC, I don't think it took them a while before they came to the UK and Europe. And would you say 
the European and the UK fan base, how do you think the UFC have benefited from that sort of the European fan base and have they grown as an organisation across Europe and across uh, Great Britain? Oh, I'd say 100%, 100%. Like, as, as you said, the initially, and even, even during Michael Bisping's main run, the fan base was nowhere near as big. And during that time, I can remember when... Uh, when Ricky Hanton went to went to Las Vegas to fight Floyd Mayweather and Manny Pacquiao, the following that he took to Las Vegas was it was it, it was it was something else. It was really a sight to behold. I remember my dad was in Vegas for a meeting, and he just said there were just so many drunk manks <laughs> in, in in Vegas throughout the Standard, entire. Standard then. <laughs> yeah, he said it was just swarmed it was swarmed with uh, with Brits. But now, uh, with the rise of uh, mixed martial arts in 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 the uk and in europe you're getting that all the time like like the irish they flock over in their droves mm-hmm. for, for a conor mcgregor fight granted they didn't do do so as much in, in in his last fight uh but i mean we've all seen the images of the thousands of conor fans that uh that go to they go to uh to america or go to wherever wherever he fights like and i just remember a prime example of that would be the uh the UFC 194 Q and A. Do you remember with Holly Holm? And then the yeah. guy started singing. I love you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just all the Irish fans in the crowd. Yeah, it's it's a sight to behold when you see. It, it, it warms my heart when I see hundreds and if not thousands of, of British or Irish or Scottish mixed martial well not Scottish because we don't really have a Scottish mixed, <laughs> major mixed martial arts star. I shouldn't say that as my fiance is Scottish and she sat through the next room, but <laughs> but. Um, it warms my heart when I see Brits and Europeans travel in their droves. And mm. e- even when, uh, I don't know if you guys were at, not the last, you, okay, obviously we, uh, we didn't have the last UFC in London. The one in 20, 2018 when Gunnar Nelson fought Alan Joban. Did any, were you any of you guys at that? Uh, uh, no, I watched it though. Oh, okay. I was going to go to. I was going to go to this year, but okay. Yeah, I know it sucked. I, well, I, have, I haven't been since Verdun beat uh, lost to uh, Volkov. Mm. Uh, it sucks. I, I was looking forward to going to that one as well because that was on paper one of the best cards they've they've had for a long time. Mm. But to give you an example, so obviously Gunnar Nelson is fighting Alan Joban, and repeatedly all you could hear were fans doing the the Viking clap. You remember yeah. the one the Iceland fans were doing yeah. the World Cup. So I mean, if it's there and there were hundreds of ice uh, of people from Iceland there as well. And Iceland, in terms of mixed martial arts, obviously it's a very very small country, and they've they've only got Gunnar Nelson. So for for see, seeing seeing that seeing those fans turn up for one of their fighters who is probably just let's say just say a top fifteen guy. That's what that's what Gunnar Nelson is. It warms the heart for me to see that. And I think even with, when Darren Till went over to uh, to Liverpool, uh, went over to Liverpool. Sorry, when he went over <laughs> to uh, to Texas to fight uh, Tyron Woodley. It was a short. It was short notice as well, but the mm-hmm. scouts just travelled in force. So, yeah, I think the and I, I think now the UFC over the last few years, they've in particular, I think because of this whole Conor Mania thing, they've realised the uh, just how diehard the fans in the UK and Ireland are. I'm going to sort of take a different approach. I'm going to ask the same question as what Mason did earlier, but I'm going to sort of try and spin it a bit. <laughs> okay. With um, can the UFC ever surpass boxing in? the sense that the organization as a whole with regards to the UFC, they have to, you know, if you want to be the best, you've got to fight the best. Whereas with the, uh, with boxing, sorry, they sort of protect and maintain their undefeated records with the champions. They don't necessarily fight the best. So in that sort of standpoint, in that sort of perspective, can the UFC or have they already surpassed boxing as an organization in that standpoint? Oh, they already have. Yeah. During that low period of what I talked about or where I said 24, uh, 2014 until maybe like, Maybe early 2017, the UFC, I, barring the, barring when Canelo would fight, because obviously Canelo just has a crazy following in Mexico, mm. they uh, they well and truly surpassed boxing because they were making the fights that people wanted to see. Like, if if it was okay, I'll, I'll use the example of Conor McGregor and Jose Aldo. If that was in boxing, they'd try give them well, as soon as Conor claimed the interim featherweight title, they'd try give him another two or three fights. Mm. Before, uh, before they actually make the unification fight. I mean, boxing has a history of making fight, of, of not making fights that should have happened or making fights far too late. 
The one for me that sticks out is uh, Lennox Lewis and Riddick Bo, which is before my time, so it's well before your time, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making it sound out as if I'm that old. I'm only 31. But um, <laughs> yeah, and the Manny Pacquiao Floyd made with the fight, that should have happened, what, a good five years before it actually did. So you've got to give kudos to the UFC when they strike when the iron's hot. And they did that with the Conor and Khabib situation and I go back to boxing again. They might have had them had another fight each and then they then they go, okay, now we'll build it up. There's another there's another um there's another added element to it. But if you do that in, in particular in boxing, there's there's risks that can happen. Like mm. when uh, when Anthony Joshua fought Andy Ruiz Jr., I mean he didn't have to take that fight, especially after uh, Jarrell Miller uh, well, tested positive for everything <laughs> under the sun. <laughs> he didn't have to take that fight. He could have gone into a Deontay Wilder fight, mm-hmm. and it, but he opted not to. And, I mean, they've they've taken a risk with the, the AJ Fury fight now by, um, by booking the rematch between uh, Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury. So I think the UFC, you've got to give them props for just pitting the best events the best and although i do hate the ranking system and i although i think some of the uh the, i question a lot of the people's uh involvement on in the rankings because of some of their decision making uh i do think it helps it, it helps with booking the matches and making sure that fans can see that right this is the number one guy this is the number two guy and this is a fight that should happen why should uh, combat sports fans watch the ufc slash mma over boxing Oh, well, I, not to like quote Connor going into the build up for the fight, yeah. but boxing is as much as I, I love it and it is a sweet science and it's a beautiful science, the art of hitting and not getting hit. It's a very, very limited rule set, though. It's a bit like, and it's not, I don't want to equate MMA to like a street fight or whatever, but it's not a true reflection of what a fight is. Like to quote John Donaher um, when he was talking about, uh, how his Danaher death squad uh, started becoming so relentless with uh, with leg locks. Why would you ignore fifty percent of the body? Why would you not use fifty percent of your body try, uh, in in combat? So, for me, for me, I think mixed martial arts it's far more exciting. There's so many more ways to win, and granted, a lot of people don't like the wrestling and grappling mm. aspect of it if it's if it's too too slow, but. That's part and parcel of fighting. I mean, if I mean, I've had plenty of fights with my older brother, like where he'd out <laughs> me or whatever, just because he's just because he's bigger than me. But it's part, it's, it's part of fighting. It's co- part of combat sports. And again, if if you like knockouts and you like finishing finishes, you you can't go any further than MMA. Just a sort of a quick one to final. Well, just a sort of final one. A couple of quick fire questions. This isn't MMA based related. I've sort of. As you said earlier, you covered a bit of football, so I just want to get your thoughts on some of the football question related. Uh, what, just quickly, what team do you support? Uh, unfortunately, I'm an Arsenal fan, but we won the FA Cup two weeks ago, actually. So yeah, it, was, it wasn't 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 too bad. Yeah, but I'm an Arsenal fan. Oh, great! Asking now, I'm a Chelsea fan. <laughs> uh, well, actually, um, where I live, I live in Fulham, and where I live, I can actually see Stamford Bridge from my balcony right now. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> uh, what have you made of the Premier League season as a whole? Um, I again, uh, I was skeptical of uh, sport restarting so soon into the coronavirus, but I was really p- thrilled with the uh, project restart and the COVID protocols that they that they took into place. And in terms of the season itself, I mean, Liverpool just ran rampant, didn't they? Mm-hmm. There, there was nobody who could who, who could stand up to them. And, and Jurgen Klopp. It took a lot of time. I think when did he take over Brendan Rodgers? I think 2015. 2015, yeah. It's taken it's taken five years for for his philosophy that, that he implemented to to bear fruit. And I think managers in, in the Premier League they need to they need to to look at that example of uh, at, at Liverpool and realize that they've got to give managers time. Yeah, I understand that at times you have to protect financial interests or or what have you and. Uh, and, and sack a manager if, if the rot if, if you can't stop the rot. But if you want progression and you want teams to grow and you want to build success, then I think you have to give managers time. But for me, like Liverpool winning the league, I I generally didn't think I'd see it in my lifetime. <laughs> like I, I know again, <laughs> actually um, the last time Liverpool won won the league prior to was uh, I think just a couple of days before I was born as well. Yeah. So 
that gives that puts the con- puts into context <laughs> how long it is, it's actually been. But they were worthy champions, and mm. uh, credit to Jurgen Klopp. But in terms of the season from an Arsenal fan, uh, it was, barring the FA Cup, it would have been it would have been a disaster. Like I mean, mm. we wouldn't have qualified for Europe, and yeah. But so Mason, who do you support then? Um, I'm a United fan. Oh, okay. So actually, the season ended up being all right for you t- towards yeah. the end. Yeah. It can it can even can get even better if we can go all the way in the Europa as well. Exactly. And do you think you're going to get Sancho? Do you think it's going to be finalized? I think I think it will happen. But it's. I was say I was, I was saying earlier in the week. Well, last week I, I, I've got a feeling it might be a similar situation to Alexis Sanchez in the build up to him arriving. Like, is yeah. he coming? Is he not? Because I know. Through the, that January month where we signed Alexis Sanchez, there was a quite there was quite a few times where we knew we were, we were signing him, but at the same time we didn't know. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I mean, I don't obviously no personal terms of there or thereabouts. But I, I just see him staying another year at Dortmund. I just think it makes more sense for him because I, I don't know. I want to see him compete one more year. I don't think. I think it's good to have Alexis Sanchez off your wage bill, but. I don't know. I think with Sancho coming in to pay four hundred grand a year, and he's my age, that's gonna, yeah. you know, that's gonna be a bit crazy for United to sort of. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know if we see Ed Woodward wanting to splash that amount of cash on a twenty-year-old. Well, it's, it's a tough one. One thing they shouldn't do: don't give him the number seven shirt. Your last four number sevens are all. Don't it's cursed. Give him the number seven shirt, yeah. It's like our number nine, and uh, obviously with Drogba over the years as well, we gave it to Torres and all that, and. Yeah, it, yeah, it, the, I do believe in the curse, and I reckon we'll give it to Werner, but it'll probably break the curse. But um, how do you see next season playing out, Shangi? Obviously, with Leeds, West Brom, and Fulham all coming up, do you think the City, Chelsea, and um, maybe even United and Arsenal do they? Do you reckon they'll bridge the gap between themselves and Liverpool? Um, I'm really happy to see Leeds back in. Uh, in yeah. The Premier- it's been what it's been 16 years since they since they're in the Premier League and yeah I was still in school when they were in the Premier League that's how, that's how long, yeah. that's how long they've, they've, they've been out Marcelo Bielsa has got them playing a really exciting exhilarating and and beautiful football so I think they'll find it tough though like they'll although that they have that free flowing attacking style works in the Championship against stronger teams in the Premier League who. Who, who will be able to sit and absorb the pressure that you put on? I, I don't know if you're gonna if they're gonna have major success playing that way. So it'll be interesting to see if they if he adapts uh, their style and Bielsa is a character as well. So uh, there's gonna be some uh, interesting interactions with managers on the touchline and interesting mm. post uh, post match interviews. But in terms of bridging the gap in Liverpool, I think the only team that can do that is City. The yeah. only, they're the only team at this moment in time. I think United. Maybe with another, maybe another two years or so, but it, it depends. Well, it depends if United if they keep Paul Pogba because I know he's he's just literally I think as of a few days ago he's just gone into the final year of his contract with you guys. So, I mean, he's a fantastic player in his day, and like when we see him play for France, it's 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 chalk and cheese. It's night and day. So, um, but I think United maybe they need to know to. Two or three, two, two, another two seasons to challenge for the title, and for Arsenal, mate, forget it for the next five years. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's going to take a long time mm. for Arteta to, to, uh, to build a team that's capable of challenging. And I mean, well, obviously we've got a, we've got Aubameyang up front, and it's, mm. it's godsend that we've got him. And, and we need to try to tie him down to a new contract, but. Even if we do chime down to a new contract, I think it'll just be a two-year contract, and then he'll probably go with he'll probably go at the end of next season. That's what I think will, will happen because at the what is it? He's thirty. I think he's thirty or thirty-one now. And yeah, yeah. Well, I'm a thirty-one-year-old, and I still feel <laughs> the uh, the peak of my athletic powers as a footballer. It's completely different, and your yeah. your window of opportunity is drastically closes with each season, with with each passing year. So. Yeah, I, I, I think he'll move on to, to Pastures new, but I don't think that will happen this summer. Um, obviously, with the recent setup under under sort of the COVID era and the Champions League, we've sort of seen like a World Cup format system now mm-hmm. uh, with the Europa League in Germany and the Champions League in Portugal. Now that they're played over 90 minutes and 120 minutes, maybe even penalty shootout, do you think, who, who do you tip to win that? Do you think that sort of will help benefit City in a way? 
Or yeah, who have you got for the Champions League? I have a strange feeling it's going to be City. I I I I I really do. Like obviously, obviously they were initially banned from the European competition for two years, and I think. Yeah. That ban should have been upheld, given given all the evidence yeah. and, and, and what have you. But <laughs> I think for me, it's going to be City or Bayern Munich, hundred percent. And just a final one for me. Obviously, I, I've seen on your uh, Twitter by you're an ambassador with Walk Off. Am I correct in saying that? That's correct. Yes. Um. So tell us how that came about and what sort of work do you do? So that came about. So I randomly received a message from uh, a gentleman who's now my now my colleague uh, called Taj. Yeah. Because uh, he saw that I worked in media, and uh, basically what Walk Off is, we uh, we're, we're we're a collective collection of uh, of, uh, of Bami individuals who who work in media, who work in in sport, and work at football clubs, or and what have you. And our aim is to to uh, disseminate information to to people from our similar backgrounds and of any backgrounds to help them fulfill their dreams of say becoming a journalist or say uh, becoming a tennis player or or or, or what have you so that's pr- that's pretty much the the crux of 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 what we do and I, I think I've been an ambassador of that for I think now six years yeah it's been about six years now and uh, so what Taj will do he'll have people re- he'll have kids reach out to him or whatever say oh I'm an aspiring journalist or what have you but I'm I'm unfamiliar with uh, with the route to take, and uh, what, what should I do to ensure that I get an opportunity to get my foot through the door and, and what have you? And then I'll get in contact with them either via like Skype like this, or we'll just talk on the phone, or I just send an email and just tell them what I did, what worked for me, and, and what ha- what have you. And if if I felt that there's been any experiences that I've had being a, a black journalist or whatever that's been detrimental to to my career mm-hmm. or things that have uh, that have helped it. So yeah, that that's basically what what I've been doing for Walk Off for the last six years. And just a final one for me. It's not necessarily a question, but more of like a message to you. Just thank you for coming on. I appreciate your time, and uh, no worries, yeah, I, I wish you all the best for the future. And obviously, I keep up to date with a lot of your stuff, so I'll be keeping a close eye on your content in the future. I don't know if you've got any more. Thing to say, Mason. No, no, no thanks. I, 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 I was I'm, say, I'm interrupting you. Sorry, dude. <laughs> I, was, I was just going to say the same as James. We appreciate the time. We've had over an hour with you, so we do appreciate the time and thank you for coming on as well. No worries, guys. Anytime, if you want any advice or what have you, or if you just want to have me back on, just give me a shout, whatever. You feel free to contact me via my mobile as well. You, you, it's no, it's no worries. I know, like when I was reaching out to people, or whatever, I was a bit skeptical of messaging them <laughs> from their mobile or what have you, but no. Anytime that you need anything or any advice, just give me a shout. I'll happily help you both out. Thank, Thank you so, you so much. much. And uh, yeah, just one final thing for me. Uh, what I want you to do for the rest of the day is just go out onto your balcony and just appreciate the pure greatness that is Stamford Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> but no, thank you so much, man. No worries, man. I won't be looking at Stamford Bridge in, <laughs> in its glory, as you say, but it's on in the balcony. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, take care, mate. Thank you very much. Yeah, no worries. Take care. Cheers.